<coughs> Hello, good afternoon, good morning everyone again. <coughs> so we have now the second keynote session starting. My name is Marco Junte, I'm the TPC chair of the conference. And <coughs> our keynote speaker is Magnus Rodig uh, from Ericsson Research in, in Sweden. <coughs> so Dr. Markus Frodig has been vice president and head of Ericsson Research since 2018. <coughs> and, and he has made a long career in, in research with Ericsson and has been developing 2G, 3G, 4G and 5G technologies. <coughs> and in that sense, he will have a long and good perspective to the topic of today, <coughs> which is 6G in a world of communication intelligent machines. Uh, <coughs> we will soon hear the pre-recorded presentation, but Magnus, would you like to say kind of uh, online real-time hello and, and your quick greetings before we play back your presentation? Okay. <coughs> maybe may, maybe there are connection issues, so we will come back <coughs> live with Magnus after the presentation. So let's go and, and see the presentation. Hello all conference participants. Thank you for inviting me to the PIMRC conference. Today I will talk about 6G and about the connected intelligent machines. My head of Ericsson Research and I'm addressing you here from the Ericsson headquarters in Stockholm. Before talking about 6G, I think it's very important to understand how 5G is, is developing. Because the success of 5G and the build out of the 5G infrastructure support, of course, the the most important sort of platform in order to launch 60 on top of that. And a lot of the use cases we envision, they will start to evolve now during the 5G era, right? So it's been a very, very good take up of 5G if you look at the two first years. So there is now 169 global live networks in operation. There are many, many devices and you are seeing now that all the high end mobile phones are support 5G and the population coverage is starting to come up and if you look at the one of the leading countries in South Korea we see that uh, the usage of the networks goes up if you have a 5G subscription and, and the average there is up to 26 gigabyte per month and in Korea there is a much higher coverage as well so we are up to 50%. Um, for Ericsson's uh, participation here, we see that we have many live networks. We are present in, 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 in almost every country here. And uh, we are also seeing that it's not only the, the first 5G, it's also sort of the standalone not coming where we have the 5G air interface, we, we have the, the radio network and also the core network and all the signaling end to end all in 5G in the standalone networks. As I said, the uptake is going very, very fast. And we had to expect a very fast uptake. And I, I think this goes a little bit faster for every generation. But even so, it's, it's faster than expected. And uh, within just only three, four, five years, we, we are seeing that we will reach sort of a 50% of the subscriptions, 50% uh, of the traffic, and the coverage will be built out now fairly rapidly and you will be able then to use 5G in all sort of populated areas. Um, and this is of course just a continuation of the 4G success going into 5G and, and we have all the interesting use cases for, for the consumers now being developed on top of the 4G and gradually 5G platform. But it's also important to look at the, all the other connected devices. And, and here we are seeing an exponential uptake of these connected IoT uh, connections. And uh, this is of course happening now on the narrow band uh, IoT, 
uh, and uh, LTEM functionality on top of 4G and it will then gradually move over to also be supported by 5G networks. And we will come back to the development we see now going even further into the evolution of all these possibilities to connect a lot of different sensors and actuators. And this will be, this is a, a key role in, in the, the era now going forward. And it's also one of the fundamentals for the connected intelligent machines that we will return to. So moving over then to the future looking parts here. We have the 5G, we will, we are sort of projecting how the, the 5G will be built out and the capabilities that 5G will, will provide. Then of course in a 6G time frame we need to think about what is then possible to build uh, in that time frame. And then you need to return a little bit to the underlying technical forces. And in order to do that we have taken uh, these 10 exponential forces which we think are the fundamentally driving the possibilities uh, on top of which we are then able to construct and build a 6G network. So first of all the ubiquitous connectivity that's of course the, the force that we are driving ourselves and that is truly exponential as I just talked about. And here of course we, we are seeing how the, the connectivity now is being built out and we will have then 5G coverage worldwide at the end of this time period. At the same time we are addressing the IoT use cases so we have the more wide area IoT use cases but also more sort of local areas of course. And there is a, an enormous demand for connecting a lot of different things. So that is, is a sort of an exponential trend in itself how the IoT uh, will grow during this time period. Then if you look at the AI um, that's of course uh, an evolving field and I think we were all sort of impressed about the, the advancements that were done showing the deep learning capabilities. Now I think we are seeing more and more advanced reasoning type of use cases and you see how this reasoning and, and learning can be more and more distributed as well. These are important uh, properties to be used within the the uh, communication networks. And of course all the connectivity, all the IoT would feed a lot of data into this AI machinery. If you have all of that you will also need a lot of compute and today a lot of these things are, are in, provided and running in the, in the cloud and that will of course continue but we are seeing already now how the cloud are being built out and being getting more and more closer to the edge and by that we will have the applications closer and closer to the devices and, and you are, will be able to provide more sort of real-time properties just because of the dedicated compute closer to the actual uh, uh, action, so to say. The trustworthiness is something which um, I would say we need to give a higher attention on going forward. Uh, we have always been working on the sort of protecting the user data, protecting identities and, and in that way provide a secure environment for mobile broadband subscribers. I think we need to have a broader view on this because we really need to provide uh, the resilience, robustness etc. that is needed in order to take on these critical applications. And there is a lot of improvements going here. We, we are seeing how, how the the research is going forward and there's a lot of different ideas on how to take step changes in this area. If you want to build the cyber physical systems you obviously need also some actuator something that makes things happen and, and are driving sort of the, the actions in the physical world and here we have a lot of these machinery right the robots that will be able to do different things and they will be more and more capable they will have intelligence on board etc so the development of building more and more advanced robots is a really key property for us here. Uh, another thing which is uh, we see improvements and we are all waiting for the 
first really commercial AR glasses, right? And with this sort of digital representation of everything and the physical world, we as humans would like then, of course, to be in the physical world, but get a lot of augmented information then coming into from the digital world and then being displayed for us when we are sort of able to move into in, be, in between these worlds. Compute, I think we are of course all following the development on the quantum compute, but I think there's also an interesting thing on neuromorphic compute, which is really specialized in order to be very energy efficient and handling a lot of these AI workloads, which will be a lot of compute needed in these environments. And then alternative energy. I think of course the, the radio networks here that, that we are building, but also the, the compute side of everything, it will take energy, right? And, and we will move them from this more centralized to the more distributed. And then it's important that all of that can be run as energy efficient as possible, of course, but also utilizing green energy. And finally then, there is a lot of basic research going on providing sort of advancements when it comes to different materials. And we are all already starting to use new materials in, in these different steps. So all of these 10 forces are exponential in their own right. But you see how they are reinforcing each other here. And this is really the foundation that we need to try to understand and estimate what it will happen during the coming years in order to design 6G so it gets really on the bleeding edge, but still possible to build. So over to the, to the use cases. What should we then use the 6G platform for? And in order to uh, have a good discussion around the future usage, we have been looking at four different use case examples here, which are then different in, in nature with, with, with different sort of stakeholders in them. I talked to you before about the Internet of Senses, where we are seeing how the today's mobile broadband type of experience will be enhanced. You will be able to share the, your full experience. It, it will be not only be the, the screen and text, it will be much more like the, the full AR VR experience, the spatial sound, you will have haptics, you will you will have sort of smell and taste and, and and so on, right? And, and you will be able to, to store these experiences. You will be able to, to share your experiences and you will be able to re-experience your experiences, etc. right? So it's a completely new way of, of interacting with the networks and the services. Uh, then over to the connected intelligent machines. Here we have all the robots, the self-driving cars, etc. And they will be very capable and have a lot of processing and they will be able to carry a lot of different sensors and uh, also a lot of, of computer and AI, so they will gradually be more and more intelligent. When you do connect these intelligent machines, you will really see how, how much data they can generate. We have that already with the self-driving cars, enormous amount of data from all the different sensors in, in the car. But you, so the data that such an intelligent machine can generate is extremely large. And, and there's also uh, no limit really how much data you can consume and, 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 and the kind of real-time properties that can be provided could lead directly to advantages if you think about these systems of systems of connected intelligent machines. Next one here is the digitalized and programmable physical world. This is really about the digital representation of the physical world. So if you have a physical world where you have a lot of sensors, you can of course get all of that sensor data into the digital world. There you have a 3D full sort of representation of the environment and then you can have an update of that in real time. And in this world, you will also have all the objects uh, which is then represented by their digital twins. So this digital representation will be very sort of rich and, and advanced. And if you would like to do a service like a augmented reality service, you will need this digital representation because you need to have a 
understanding of the surroundings, you need the orientation of the glasses, you will need to understand that there is a flat surface where I can put this virtual object, etc. And you would like to have information attached to moving objects, etc. etc. So this digital representation is a fundament in order to do a lot of these uh, augmented reality services. In the same way, the intelligent machines will not be able to navigate and move without this knowledge about how the environment looks like. So the, the digital and programmable physical world is a key is a key type of use case and also fundamental for, for the other ones here. Finally, I think it's worth a lot to talk about the connected sustainable world. And the vision here is really that we can use all of these uh, new services and, and all the connectivity and by that making all the different things that goes around uh, around us more efficient and just the first level of savings there is just, it, it estimates that you can directly contribute to like 15 percent reduction of co2 emissions but that just doing what you do already but more efficient then of course when you start to do things in completely new ways you, it can change more dramatically and uh, I think a lot of the economic growth we are seeing going forward will be all in the digital domain. So we can generate a lot of values. We can have a, an economic growth, but we can use less of materials. And by that, we can make less of a footprint to the environment. Then we shouldn't forget that it's also important to reduce the energy consumption of the ICT systems in itself. And 5G took or have taken a significant step forward compared to previous generations. So when we are modernizing the networks now and moving traffic towards 5G and gradually can turn off all the systems, that will in itself have a huge effect on, on the energy consumption of the radio networks and, and the mobile networks. Of course, in 6G we we'll need to go even further on this track. So, let me then focus in a little bit on these connected intelligent machines. And I think this is sort of the, the most important slide here in this presentation. And it's about this 6G, this moving in a cyber physical continuum. We have the physical world where you have all the machinery and you have all the sensors, the actuators and everything which is happening over there, right? And then you have the digital world which is then programmable and this is a representation of the physical world. And in between here you have the networks, right? So the network really can provide then this intelligent, ever-present connectivity, provide this full synchronization between then the physical and the digital world. And when you can do this, you can realize how the different services here are generated. Of course, we have the, the digitalized and programmable world, which is, which is exactly this fundament, but also the Internet of Senses. You are, you are in the physical world and getting all of this digital uh, augmented information. You have your connected machines, which have a lot of the intelligence in the digital side, right, and actuates out in the physical world. And if you think about this in the bottom there, how you then can observe and act in real time. It's not only that, right? You can look back as well, so you can sort of do root cause analysis of what happens. You can look at the data that you had, and by that you can learn a lot of things, right? So you can create not only a digital representation, you can also create a real-time updated model of this situation with all the different digital twins moving in there. And if you can do that, you can also start to predict what will happen in the future. And, and you can also think about you want to activate on something. Then you can simulate the outcome of different actions. And by then selecting the, the action that leads to the outcome that you're looking for, you then have this programmability of the physical world from the digital. So is this happening already then? And yes, it is. Let me show you a few examples here now to get a little bit more specific. First is one from uh, the, our own industry here and, and what we are doing together with uh, our telecommunication operators and, and all the infrastructure and the cell sites that we have. 
So the first step here towards this, and this is something we are doing then sort of offline, right? So there is a, a drone flying around the site, and it's created then a point cloud out of that sort of video coverage. And from that point cloud, we are then able to make a model of the site, and we can then add then the different products that we have, and by that you can sort of have a full sort of digital model of the site. And this is extremely valuable if you want to do maintenance, if you do want to do upgrades, etc. This is still offline, right? So we have done this now for, for a large number of, of cell sites. This is sort of 20, 50,000 sites, right? But it's, it's of course even more powerful if you're able to have this updated uh, online in real time. So you can see how we can do this this uh, cell service more, more regular, or you can have it standby, or, or you can sort of have it ongoing. And how if you can add observability, of course, from the products, and, and then being able to have even more sort of real-time updated information about what's happening at the site. So this is something going on in the telecommunication industry. Another industry which is early out here and, and have really, really advanced uh, requirements and are pushing forward strongly here. And as I say, this is not coming from the telecom guys, right? This is coming from the manufacturing that they, they are transforming their manufacturing into a smart, smart manufacturing and, and smart factories. And in, in, in such a scenario, there will be a lot of things happening here on the factory floor. Of course, you have the inventory keeping track of everything. It is, of course, a lot of sensors on all the materials, and you are able to follow, follow the material flow through this factory. Then, of course, you have the interaction with the outside, with, with all the logistics and the tracking of that. Then you have video sensors and cameras then in, the, in this factory, obviously. And then you can start to do these use cases. Perhaps one of the first will be these uh, automated guided vehicles which are then moving around things that could be then be self-driving and by their own understanding how they will optimize different flows here in the factory. You can also have robotics, of course, and, and different collaborating robots. And if you have one robot, of course, you can have the, all the control in the robot, but you have multiple robots. There is an advantage of also having a support from, from the uh, a central function right in the factory that can understand how different robots are, are collaborating. And what, what they are then doing is then they will do exactly this real-time digital representation of this production. They will have this real-time monitoring and by that they will sort of optimize this, this production and increase quality and, and maintenance and plan everything here. And, and of course there's a lot of safety applications in such a factory as well. That is, that's our, our key, key for this use case. I have one more example, and this is something that we have created, um, a little bit speculating in how it could look like from a little bit more human perspective, if you are surrounded by these uh, robots, and how such a, a future could look like. I think we got away. I'm not so sure, Mom. He's still out there. Quit being so dramatic. Game over, Val. No, we can still make it. Use the bubble gun. What, are you crazy? I've run the scenario 21,465 times. Silly dog wants me to fight demon with bubbles. Hurry! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Calm down. Ah, <laughs> 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 told you it would work. Let's play something else. Fetch! Honey, you got it, you got it, you got it. Mom, maybe we should slow down a bit. Don't you start now. I'm winning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
You let this happen. I'm sorry, but according to my calculations, putting your arm in that position was necessary to avoid a fracture on your femoral neck. Sorry, but I have to ask, how do you win at fetch? Guess you don't know everything, do you? So, interesting future, right? And uh, let's reflect a little bit on what we saw in that, in that uh, view into the future here. So we were seeing, seeing a lot of this uh, human assistant, right? Different forms of extra powers provided to, to the woman here. Uh, we can of course see uh, future AR gaming applications. Uh, this robot dog is really a, a very, very nice example on a human machine, coexistence type of situation. Um, the system behind it is, of course, a lot of, of intelligence and, and reasoning, but also in a distributed way. Um, you can think about having sensors in, in everything here, uh, both uh, on body, in body, and, and then, of course, it's important here that we have this explainability and also the, the human oversight in order to be able to trust uh, these, these, uh, these networks and these applications. So then shifting here to uh, what to use it for and I started to think a little bit about how we could build it, right? So what is really needed and in order to, to provide, um, and I'm focusing here on the, the networking part of this. There's of course a, a broad ecosystem that needs to be involved in order to provide the robots and, and the applications and everything, right? But if you were zoom in a little bit on the on this network and, and then we, we talk about this intelligent network platform and it really consists of these four pillars here. So it of course has a lot of connectivity and, and here we, we are of course improving the connectivity all the time and we are now in the step from 5G to 6G to improve connectivity. But it's so important that we, we also together then optimize the trustworthiness. So we really need to add the, the resilience, robustness aspects into these on top of already the, the security type of capabilities that we have. It really needs to be truly data driven. It's only not only the, the applications on top and all the reasoning around, but the network itself needs to be much more data driven and cognitive. So in order to do that, we need, really need from the beginning to design in what kind of data we need how we can structure the functionality so we're able to sort of self-learn more and more of, of the today very much programmed domain knowledge that we have in the networks. And then finally there is a lot of compute and this is compute both for sort of network functionality but of course also for applications and to provide uh, a very high level of, of real-time uh, services here and the enormous amount of data we have, you realize that we need to, to optimize both the, the storage, the processing, the connectivity in order to provide the services we are looking for here. So let's go a little bit deeper into this um, the limitless connectivity here, since I, I guess that's closest to heart to most of you here on, on, the, on the conference. 
And doing so, I think we can see that adaptability would be needed. We will need a lot more of end-to-end -end functions. There is an extreme performance that we are looking at here. And as always, there is always a lot of innovation on the device side that needs to be, be taken into account here. And let me go a little bit deeper in some of these areas. So when we are talking about the network adaptability, um, we are, will of course continue to see how different devices are, are being connected and we will have with this integrated access and back call. So we will have moving relays, we will have satellites, we will have sort of specific system for confined areas, etc. etc. So the, it will be more dynamic. Uh, and the requirements of the network then to adapt all of these different things will be higher. Then when it comes down to the architecture, I think we are now moving into more and more cloud native ways of building the, the network functionality and that will of course continue. And we really need to take steps forward here in order to have an architecture which makes it possible then to sort of isolate sort of functionality. We need to be able to optimize and, and make sort of the overall to strive for simplicity in this. It will be very, very complex anyhow, right? But we, we really need to get a, as simple as possible structure here. And then what, what opportunities opens up if you are able to program things, right? And if you increase the programmability on the network side and can do that on the device side as well, then that of course opens up for that you can change both sides depending on exactly what you like to do at the moment. And that, that could open up for an even faster time to market for new services and, fe and features, right? And then of course if something are really taking off and becomes standardized, you want to optimize, perhaps it's very suitable to also standardize but it will be possible to do things even before a standard. So this is, this is a very, very important area about the adaptability. Then we have a little bit more of the classic things and, and I think we also for this generation would look at higher frequencies. So if we were stretching 5G up to the millimeter waves, this will be then what is called the sub terahertz, so, so up to 100, 300 gigahertz. And uh, that will be very interesting to see. And, and I think that going so high in frequencies that that will open up, of course, a, a reason to, to evaluate different uh, modulation schemes and everything, of course. So that's very fundamental research that is very, very relevant to, to look at. The coexistent thing, we have now been very successful in 4G to 5G where we are able to share the spectrum making it possible to have a 4G and a 5G system running at the same time, right? And just on a millisecond basis decide if it's a 4G or 5G signal going out depending on the capabilities of the devices. That, that I think has come to stay and, and that will also be then needed to have to provide in the 6G. We are starting up these local licenses and I think this will take off now in 5G and it will be further optimized uh, in a 6G time frame. On the connectivity side, we have this multi-site and, and connectivity and everything. I, I really think if, if, if 5G now were a lot about uh, MIMO and massive MIMO, I, I think we will have the distributed massive MIMO being provided in a 6G time frame. This really has the promise of having a a base station or, or, a, or a network node which is distributed and you will have a lot of different strong connections at the same time to, to the devices. And you are then able to have higher data rates, but most importantly, you are able to address this robustness and availability that would be really expected in order to address a lot of these very advanced use cases. It's a lot to talk about sensing and of course using the radio network as a sensor is an interesting field of research that is starting up. And uh, of course if you do it a little bit on lower frequencies you're able to sense larger areas and if you go up on higher higher frequencies then you, your position will you, you can have an ultra high resolution in this sensing. And you can think about of course 
this could be a key thing in order to have this real-time updated understanding of the environment. And this can be used, of course, for the application that I talked about, but it can also be used for the radio network in itself. If you're able to know the radio conditions that you will have in the next slot, you can, of course, directly adapt your transmission to, to that situation. And by that, you can decrease your, your packet loss rate, etc., and optimize your, your transmissions. So this is in, an interesting development that you will be able to use the sensing in predicting this environment. And um, finally here in examples, um, I said something that devices will be, will be key here. And of course, uh, if you want to do super simple devices, then you need to get them to use lower and lower energy. And we're even here looking at the zero energy. And that will then be sort of even simpler than the LTEM narrowband IoT type of devices that we have. And then, of course, the NR, we are already now working with this red cap, the reduced capabilities, in order to, to have an NR version, which is less demanding than from, from the device energy consumption perspective. But, of course, there is a price. So if you are able to spend more energy, you can have more capabilities, obviously. So we need to be adaptable. And if we have this functionality, we, we are then able to move into these sensors everywhere, these trillions of devices that is all connected. And you can think about a lot of things in agriculture, you can think about the manufacturing that I talked about, all the smart cities, all the persons with all these on-body and in-body sensors. So I think this is opening up an enormous possibilities. So to conclude here, if you want to read and reflect a little bit more and, and have a little bit more information around this, then we have a, a white paper here describing our 6D vision. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. The, over to the Q&A session. Thank you, Magnus. A very interesting talk, very nice views on the future. Okay, so we will have already some questions in the chat, but before going to those, I will use my privilege as a chair to ask a couple of <coughs> uh, sta starting questions. So, if we start from what is maybe not the main expertise and area of the people in this conference, um, how well do you think the, the, let's say, encoding, decoding, reproduction of all these new senses like uh, <coughs> smell, touch, all that has developed? So that do you expect that we will see it really as part of our 6G in network in 2030s? Or will that be more like 7G? How, what, what is your view on that? I think you are, Magnus, I think you are muted, so. Okay, now, okay. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, no, I, I was muting myself here because there was a little bit of background noise. So. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the capabilities of these devices uh, and, and uh, of course the, the fact that we would like to have so much more than, than uh, video and, and sound, Uh, of course, uh, a, a new way of encoding. Um, of course, you would like to compress and encode the feedback. Um, and then uh, if you then have smell or taste or, or something, you would like to do the same. And I think we will see new data formats, new codes, etc. But that I think we can solve. I, I think it is really the the detectors of the smell and how to generate the smell on the other mm -hmm. side, which will be the real challenges. The, when we have that information, I think to, to forward it from one side to another, we will do. So it's more on this, how actually to do these actuators. And, and then people are talking about these brain computer interfaces to, to shortcut that, so to say. 
Uh, and then, of course, I think we are further out in time. Yes. Mm. Okay, that's definitely an interesting area. So, and maybe another warm-up question. Uh, <coughs> we will have uh, again a lot of data, and and we need to do the sustainability, which is one of the main themes of this conference. <coughs> so, how do you foresee? How do we guarantee the energy resource efficiency? What what are the key areas we need to work on? So, let's say in the spirit mm -hmm. of this year's PMRC, I'd like to you to say a few words on that. Yeah, I think I think the challenge is more of having the energy at the right place. I, I think I think we will with wind and solar, etc., will will be able to produce a lot of energy uh, going forward. If you look at this in a ten-year perspective. So the problem will be that we need to store that energy in order to use it. And, and if we have it in some one place, we need to be able to, to transport it, I think. So I think we really need to think about how this distributed infrastructure that we are foreseeing here with a lot of connectivity and compute and storage, right? Um, how that could then be connected to the distributed um, infrastructure on, in the, on the energy in smart ways and then improve the battery uh, capabilities uh, I, I think we can uh, we can afford to spend uh, the needed energy here on this of course we will do everything we can in order to reduce but there is some physical things right on what is needed in order to transfer information and in order to do the compute and, and we do see massive compute needs here right so we really need to make sure that this is run on green energy. That would be my answer. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So let's move on <clears throat> to questions from the audience. So Roger Hofer is asking, <clears throat> what are the technologies that allow conformance integration tests to AI machine learning devices and systems. So, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a very in interesting area. So once we have all these new features, we will at some point need to test them, verify, so on. So, so what's your your take on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is a key key questions, and and I think we haven't fully solved that one, obviously. Um, I think we will. I think one of the key things is that we can have this digital representation of the network. So we we can be, we will be able to to learn uh, and to test and, and to verify things uh, before we have it in in sharp operation. Um, so so I, I think to have this digital version of the system that where you're able to, to play a little bit back and forward and, and investigate different sort of machine learning states and, and see if they are then performing or not. That that could of be of course be, be one thing. And then if you have such a digital representation, you can also then of course construct test cases in a new way uh, where you can try to test it against all of these um, new possible errors then from a machine learning world. Um, but I, I can only agree with the, with the, with the question mm -hmm. here that this is a, a super key area on this new software technologies that we will need. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> this question may be related also to <clears throat> the big question in the AI community that how to uh, make self-performance guarantees of AI systems, <coughs> how to make them explainable and, and all that. So I think that's maybe the partial answer also to the conformance mm -hmm. testing in the 6G context. Yes, agree. Yes. Yeah. Okay, then <coughs> Mehdi is asking, uh, thanking you for the nice talk, <coughs> and, and he's asking the robot dog is some sort of new human-centric use case where the dog has not seen a similar scenario in his training environment. <clears throat> Can you unpack a bit more how is that problem solved? In other words, <clears throat> when there is no data, 
when let's say no previous falling or, or <coughs> falling pattern was recognized from the from the earlier data so so how was the doc in some sense able to generalize the learning mm. yeah I, I guess this this example here trying to show the the relation between sort of centrally known knowledge which is very valuable and and in from hopefully in those cases you can ask centrally then and get sort of another road dog that has solved the similar situation and you can take that learning and apply but we also leave that there is a lot of distributed intelligence that you then need to solve uh, given that you or on your own and, and there's no backup sort of either there is no connectivity or if there is no similar fault <laughs> fall mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay is the connection problem can I'm not sure if we heard the ending of can you maybe repeat <clears throat> Magnus, can you hear us? Found them. I don't hear right yeah. now. And then just illustrate the fact that it's not. Then exactly how did yeah. yeah, with my connect perhaps. I can hear you, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, now you are back, yeah. thanks. Do you hear me now? Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I was trying to say that, um, yeah. We're only trying to, to illustrate the relationship between the central and the distributed and, and we're really believing that the distributed piece of this is important. <clears throat> okay, I, I see. Okay, let's move on. Tao is asking, <clears throat> how do you see the openness in 6G development? <clears throat> Will Open RAN play an important role in, in 6G evolution? So yeah, I think Open sure, RAN yeah. is now hot already for 5G. So can you comment <clears throat> how do you foresee it here and, and then in, the, in 6G as well? Yeah, I, I think we are now taking clear steps in the direction of uh, openness already now right and um, i think it's an important component in this intelligent network platform that i was talking about because i think it's it's so needed that the network can interact with the compute and with the applications and etc right and, and we are seeing this more horizontalization of these networks so the openness and the possibility to expose sort of values out of the network in, in new ways, I think these are key. And um, then uh, it, I think it will continue. We will continue to build in this way. Uh, the, the industry will develop. It will be new players coming in and, and there will be uh, different ways of providing these uh, intelligent network platforms. We Ericsson, of course, would like to do as many pieces as possible, right? But uh, I think there will be many, many players and, and there will be new competition. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Matti is asking uh, how to foster the development of 6G era <clears throat> in 30s also for rural, rural and un underdeveloped societies <clears throat> so that we don't increase the digital divide but rather try to diminish it so of course that's an important aspect of the sustainability as well so do you have a vision for that um, i think that the the technology here is, is evolving and, and we have seen how the mobile broadband has been a value for also for the rural and underdeveloped societies and, we, and it has pro provided great values. And, and of course, I, I foresee that 60 will work on, on providing even more coverage and, and connectivity, of course, to these not, not yet connected areas, etc. And from a technology point of view, I think we could could solve that. And there's a lot of ideas. 
so so it's more of, of this uh, how to get the financing how to get the different societies to have a, to, they can afford building the networks i, I think these are more the, the questions than the 5g or 6g actually so so i think it's more of a, a business case or, or an economic question actually than a technology question to my mind mm -hmm. um, then there is a lot of things going on which really is we have this technology war we are sort of um, having a race now for for the most powerful compute the most powerful ai etc and that of course is driving in the, in the in the other direction i think so so i think it's an extremely relevant questions uh, but uh, yeah from pure technology point of view, I think it's, it's it's actually pushing a little bit in the opposite direction, and I would really really like to see more of of, of um, societal effort in order to provide the coverage and the values into more areas, of course. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Maybe I can connect <clears throat> or continue one question on. On this, how do you see the role of satellites in this rural area connectivity? <clears throat> I think there was a recent semi news that Apple would bring satellite connectivity to iPhones, but I, I think that they are now planning to introduce some sort of emergency service there, which is, of course, a step forward. But <clears throat> do you see that satellites will play a big role there, either in 5G or 6G? Mm -hmm. I think we we are seeing the the sat satellite component as being more relevant and stronger. Uh, I, I think there are clear advancements in the possibility to to provide sort of more cost efficient, uh, affordable services, and uh, then it could be an interesting complement to the existing networks. So so that's all good, right? And 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 I think. Uh, I mean, the typical iPhone buyer is perhaps not a target group here if you want to provide coverage to the unconnected. But gradually, of course, yeah. the technology could be more affordable, uh, etc. So uh, we always have the, the more wealthy businessman out in the hike that could then make a call, right? That, that's one type of application. And, and that we can do fairly soon, I think. Uh, but to, to have this uh, fully to be able to have this digitalization with, with sensors, data, and, and also connectivity then to more rural areas, that will of course be very, very good. The problem is then, of course, that you still have the link budget issues, obviously, the uplink is, it will not be that strong and, and you will need to be outdoor typically, or you will have some extra antenna, et cetera, et cetera. And then you are moving further and further away from the mainstream sort of standard low on the telephone that you would like to use, I think. So mm, still a lot to do there, I think. Mm -hmm. OK, I think we have time <clears throat> for one or two more questions. So if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. <clears throat> in the meanwhile, I could ask, uh, let's say, my final question maybe. So you mentioned this new frequency band and <clears throat> as a kind of theoretician who has liked to work on sub terahertz millimeter wave for some time now. <clears throat> How do you foresee what are the most important use cases of this deep band and sub terahertz bands up to 300 gigahertz? Are they some, let's say, fast connections to support uh, industrial control or autonomic traffic? Or do you foresee that they will appear also as part of the <coughs> mobile phone or uh, extended reality, head reality headset? Or where do you see the case for, for those mostly? Mm, yeah, it, it, it feels like it will be short range, right? So, so I, I could imagine that you have you have some special equipped places where you can you can have some very advanced gaming or experience uh, experiences of some kind, right? So, I I I would uh, think that it it will come in some sort of Internet of Senses emerge very immersive connectivity service that perhaps is just offered in some very specific places. 
uh, and you gradually can perhaps bring to your home and have it in your home. And then you can think of bringing it to a company, a conference room or something. So I think we will see it first in, in sort of dedicated places where you can do a, a very dedicated investment in order to have that connectivity. That would be my, my guess. Okay, <clears throat> so it seems that we don't have any more questions on the chat. And okay, the time is almost up. So thank you, Magnus. <clears throat> very interesting talk, very nice discussion. And uh, with this, we will conclude this session. We still have one more panel to go today. <clears throat> and tomorrow we will resume with our third keynote, which is more technology oriented. Uh, on, on terahertz actually so in that sense it was we will hear more, more about <coughs> challenges and opportunities on that that tomorrow thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of the conference <coughs>